you have never failed. As the song said, we seek you and you hear and you answer. And Father, we thank you for that tonight. We thank you for that, your, your grace and your mercy. You were just so good, Lord God. And we just, we're just anticipating, Lord God, a move from you in our very lives, Lord God. In this season, in this time, Lord God, we won't look to the news, Lord God. We won't look to the world, Lord God. We will look to your word, Lord God, for a forecast of what's to come. And we thank you, Lord God, that it is good news. And Father, we decrease and pray that you would increase tonight, Lord God. Pray that you would move by your spirit, Lord God. We pray that you would just use me tonight as a spoon or a fork to bring food to the body that we might grow thereby, Lord God. And we pray, Lord God, that there's no distance in spirit, Lord God, that, Father, whatever is needed tonight, Lord God, you know what's pressing on the hearts, Lord God. You know what's pressing on the minds, even those, Lord God, who will watch this, Lord God, recording via social media on the various platforms, Lord God. And I pray even now for them, Lord God, that it would bless them, that it would turn their hearts, that it would encourage them, Lord God. We come to be edified tonight, Lord God. We come to be equipped, Lord God. We come, Lord God, so that you might so fill us to overflowing. Then that overflow, Lord God, may it extend to our family, our friends, our loved ones, and to the world. Father, we thank you tonight for that. We glorify you and we magnify you. It is in the mighty name of Jesus that we seal this prayer. And all of God's people say, amen, amen, and amen. God's statements or promises or statements or promises, God's word to us. Statements or promises, God's word to us. Let me make sure that this is the right version. That I, okay. Yes, this is. Praise God. So the Bible study tools are the same each week. Strong's exhaustive concordance, which translate the uh, New Old Testament, which is the Hebrew and the Greek, into uh, what we can understand today. Uh, in the also in the New Testament, the it was translated from the Greek. And so we need these Bible study tools in order to help us to better study the word of God, as well as Matthew Henry's commentary on the whole Bible. That's your study Bible on steroids, Bible dictionary in various Bible translations. I say these things each week, but I never take for granted that there may be somebody new that may be watching or someone that may pop in. Uh, that has no understanding of how to gain a foundation in studying the word of God. So if you get these things, you are pretty much well equipped to study the word of God. And without further ado tonight, we're going to go with the first question. Uh, you don't have to speak into the microphone. You can, you can verbalize your uh, answer or you can remain silent if you're not sure. But there are no right or wrong answers because we're going to go to the word of God to settle it. You can type it into the chat box. Uh, but without further ado, the first question is, what are some of God's promises to us? If you could just rattle off one or two that you can think of, some of God's promises to us. Some of God's promises to us. <clears throat> if you believe in him, you should have everlasting life. Amen. Everlasting life. Okay. Uh, obey your parents. We're staying in the chat. Obey your parents that we will have long life. Uh, also honor them and honor them. Okay. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? All right. Sometimes God will speak a, a verbal word to you. Okay, a promise to speak spirit. a verbal word to you in your spirit, communicate with you. Okay. All righty. He has plans to prosper us and not harm us. Amen. Jeremiah 29, 11. Amen. All right. No weapon should form a prosper against us. Amen. No weapon that's formed against us shall prosper. Isaiah 54, 17. Praise God. Amen. 
Amen. Let us dig into the word. Let us go to Romans tonight. Romans chapter four, starting at verse 13. Romans chapter four, starting at verse 13. <clears throat> For the promise that should be the heir of the world, excuse me, for the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through righteousness, through the righteousness of faith. May God add a special blessing to the hearers and the doers of his word. We're going to move on and go down in these scriptures when I want to pause and stop right there. Because we have to understand what is being said here. Talked about the promises of God. Talked about, and some of you brought up some great ones. You know, he promised to prosper us. He promised to, you know, uh, he would protect us. Where it says that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. He promised us if we obeyed our parents that we would be given long life. And so some of these things I put on the screen here, they're generic. Uh, but they, I, most certainly they have scriptures. If I would have put scriptures to all of these promises, they would be exhaustive. We'd probably have 15, 20 slides, but promise to be with us. You know, he says he will never leave us nor forsake us. Promise to protect us. Promise to be our strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Uh, I will answer you. Uh, I will provide for you. I will give you peace. I will always love you. He says all of those things in various scriptures throughout the Bible. For God so loved the world. That was before we even decided to serve him. He said that he so loved the world. He didn't say, I so love the church goer. I so love the person that's serving me. No, I so love that nasty, filthy world that we were all a part of. He says, I so love the world that he gave. He gave his very best for us, even while we were yet sinners. So here it is. It says, for the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or his seed through the law, but through righteousness of faith. So I want us to understand a lot of times people forget that when God made a promise to Abraham, Right. And we're going to get to the to deeper into this teaching. But for the for the genesis of this teaching, when God made a promise to Abraham, there was no law. There was no 10th commandments. There was no Levitical law. In fact, uh, the promises were given to Abraham 430 years before the law was ever given. So the law could not annul the Abrahamic covenant. In other words, you know how many times, you know where God says in the Bible, if you do this, I'll do this. If you do this, I'll do this. And like one of the uh, scriptures uh, that Christina was mentioning or talking about is actual a scripture where it says, honor thy mother and thy father is the first commandment with promise that thy days may be long. The promise that God made to Abraham preceded this Abraham, uh, this, this mosaic mosaic, what they would call a uh, covenant or this mosaic law, uh, the 10th commandments, the book of Leviticus, you look through there and there's over 600 laws that all have promises attached to them. What God was promising to Abraham happened before that. I want us to understand that God makes a distinction. And this is so very deep and profound that it, it, it blows my mind still uh, that God would do this. But I want us to understand for context, when God is talking about this promise, keep in mind, there is no law. There is no 10th commandments. There is no book of Leviticus. There is nothing but God's promising to Abraham what he's going to do. And let's go there right now for a moment. Let's go to Genesis. Genesis chapter 17. Genesis chapter 17, starting at verse four. <clears throat> this is this is God talking with Abraham. As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham. 
for a father of many nations have I made thee. I want us to stop right there for a moment and understand that Abraham was called a father of many nations before he had his first child. Oh, we need to write this down, highlight it. God will always call us something that we're not before we even get there to the point of which we become what it is that he calls us. God called Abraham a father of many nations, and Abraham had yet to have his first child. I want us to put write that down, understand that. This is a promise. Uh, and it says in verse six, I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between thee and thy seed. Oh, we need to see that right there. I'm pausing right there for a moment. I will make my covenant between me and thy seed. Who gets the covenant? Abraham and his seed. So that means that everything that God is talking about, he's applying to Abraham and his seed after the end, the generations for an everlasting covenant. What does everlasting mean forever? Everlasting covenant, everlasting does everlasting end. I just asking questions to be rhetorical, but does everlasting ever end? No, it does not ever end. Everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee. To be a God unto thee, capital G, and to thy seed after thee. Notice all of the I will statements, which are promises in this scripture. God does not make statements. He makes promises. And God gave me a revelation of this. He brought me back to this because sometimes we look at the word of God and we read it like it's a it's a it's a, 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 a novel or something. Not, not that we don't have faith in what it is that that is being written, not that we don't have faith in what is being spoken through the word of God. But if we look at our lives and how we live, it's like God made a statement and that statement doesn't pertain to me. The Bible says that all the promises of God are yea and amen. Notice the I will promises that God made to Abraham. I will make thee exceedingly fruitful, and I will make the make nations of thee in verse six. Kings shall come out of thee. Verse seven, and I will establish my covenant. Notice it's God that's saying this. Is there anybody else that God is asking for to be in agreement with what it is that he's going to do? I'm just for the sake of teaching this, we got to understand when you get this, oh my God, we got to get the revelation of this because walking in this revelation, it brings peace. God is not asking for anybody to agree with what it is that he's going to do. I want us to point that out. He's not saying agree. No, I'm going to do this. I will promises made by God. All of these that are I will promises made by God. He's not just talking. He's not just making a statement. He's not just writing a check that he can't cash. He's saying, I'm going to do this. These are what are called unconditional. Now, if God wills to do something, rhetorical question, who can stop him? If God says that I'm going to do this, who is going to stop him? There's not a demon. There's not a devil. There's not a cohort. There's not anybody around living, breathing, dead, in the spirit realm, none. There's nobody that can stop God from doing something that he wills to do. And we saw that in other scriptures, when it said he hardened the heart of Pharaoh. And even, they even, even Paul asked the rhetorical question. They say, well, how will you find fault? If God says that he's going to harden his heart, then he can't, he don't have a choice. And say, well, who are you to reply against God? Who do you, who are you to question against? Who do you, who are you to question God? Can the thing formed say to the thing that formed it, why have you made me thus? Same sense here. Who can stop the I will of God, the will of God? Let's take the I out of it. Who can stop the will of God? And I want us to key in on the fact that he was already a father of many nations, not because he had children, but because God made the promise. 
are we following? And so go to Numbers. Old Testament, few books down. Go to Numbers, chapter 23 and 19. Numbers 23, 19 in the King James as well. This is a re reiteration. This is for us to have, uh, be equipped with the word of God so that we understand faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing. First is a blanket statement. It's a promise. It's a statement by God that is a promise. I'm, I wanted us to draw the two and put, pull the two together. God is not a man that he should lie. Our problem is we compare God's faithfulness to man's faithfulness. Man has, man has promised us some things and hasn't come through. Man has even lied and put God's signature at the bottom of something and said, God told me and, and he put God's signature. God told me and I, and I got the revelation and God said this and God said that. And so what we do is we equate what the person said that God said to what God said. And then when it doesn't happen, now we're disappointed with God. No, the person just lied. And so the enemy does this to shake people's confidence in his promises. So he, so, so the enemy, the Bible says that he has his ministers that walk around as angels of light. They have women's conferences. They have men's conferences. They put titles on their name. They're deacons, they're pastors, they're this, they're that. And they all are not telling the truth. And so we have to be careful that when man says something and puts God's signature at the bottom of it, that he's not committing forgery. A lot of people are committing spiritual forgery when they're saying God said or God told me or God told me to tell you X, Y, Z. God ain't saying everything that people saying God said. So we have to be careful. We have to be mindful. We have to also pray for revelation. We got to pray for revelation and discernment. <clears throat> God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken and shall he not make it good? In other words, you don't have to worry about God coming through. You don't have to worry about whether or not God is going to come through. God is going to answer. God is going to remain faithful. There's another, there's several scriptures in the word of God where one of them that talks about God says, he says, I watch over my word to perform it. I'm waiting for my word to be spoken so that I can perform it. I'm waiting for my word to come out of your mouth. I'm waiting for my promises to come out of your mouth. I'm waiting. See, when you, when you think about the old Testament, new Testament, it's called the will of God. Why? It's a live. It's a will signed in the blood of Jesus. Jesus which was the testator, he died and left us a will. So in the natural, if you have a will and the will says that you get the house, you get the land, you get the beach house, you get all of these things, you're not asking for permission to get any of these things. They already belong to you. The will is the will. God's word is a promise. It's already finished. The great judge has already looked over the will and said, it all belongs to you. Let's go to Hebrews. Let's go to Hebrews. This is a mindset shift. We have no business as believers and as Christians walking around, followers of Christ, doom and gloom, head down, stuck in the sand, Yes. Do we have feelings and we have emotions? Yes, but don't stay there. Please don't. Please don't. Do we have thoughts? Yes. Most of them we need to just cast down because there are the enemy trying to attack our minds, trying to lie to us. And has lied to us. We just need to know what to do with the lies. We got to discard them. So Hebrews chapter six, starting at verse 13.
Hey, man, they, I mean, they should have some discernment to your question, sister. They should have some discernment in regards to issues of life. Yes. Issues and directions. Absolutely. Because the word of God is a lamp unto our feet. There are, the, the Bible says that there is no things that come upon us, no temptations that are not common to man. But God has given us a way to escape. And it's the word of God. So Hebrews chapter six, verse 13 when God made promise to Abraham, he could swear by no greater. He, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself. That's what I wanted to point out. When God was making a promise to Abraham and his seed, he didn't, he, because he could swear by no greater. You know how people go into the courtroom and they say, do you swear to tell the whole truth? You know, you tell, tell you, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? So help me, God. They're swearing by God in the courtroom. Well, if you're God, who are you going to swear by? There's nobody higher than you. So God swear by himself. Saying, surely I will bless thee. In multiplying, I will multiply thee. So who is the confirmation for the promises to Abraham and his seed? God himself. He's the guarantor. He's the one that says it's going to happen. Verse 15. And so after he had patiently endured... He obtained the promise. For verily, for excuse me, for men verily swear by the greater an oath of confirmation is to them an end of all strife, wherein God willing more abundantly to show the heir, unto the heirs of the promise the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath. Immutability means unchangeable, unchangeability. This does not change. The promises that I'm making have not changed. And I'm confirming it by an oath from which I'm swearing by myself that I'm going to keep. That by two immutable things, unchangeable things, in which it was impossible for God to lie. It's impossible for God to lie. We might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay a hold upon the hope that is set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. This should anchor our souls. What does that mean? Anchor, anchor. You think about a boat. You think about the storms of life. When the storms of life come, what storms? News from the doctor, bank account, light bill, water bill, whatever it is, kids acting up. When the storms of life come, the promises of God are what keep me anchored. They keep me steadfast. They keep me from being schizophrenic. They keep me from being paranoid. They keep me from going up and being one way one day and one day the next. They keep me from having, saying all different types of things out of my mouth, saying I trust God on Monday and next time on, on Thursday, it's like I lost my mind. And then on Saturday, I trust him again. And then on Monday, I'm speaking doubt. And then on Wednesday, I'm back trusting him again. No, God says, I don't need any schizophrenic Christians. I don't need any double-minded, I need your soul to be anchored in the hope. The hope is I've already confirmed promises to you that I swore that I would keep. Now, if man were to tell you something and you really can't trust the man because man can fail, you can kind of understand, well, you know, he, he did this and he didn't do this and, you know, something could come up and happen. There's nothing going to come up that God is not a match for. In our lives, we have to understand that. So the question that we have to ask ourselves tonight and in our meditation time, am I truly anchored in the promises of God? Do I truly believe that he's protecting me, that he's my strength, 
that he's answering me. Maybe not when I want him to, but he's always answering me. Maybe not with the answer that I want, but the best choice of, of direction for my life. Is he always my provider? No matter whether or not they laid off 10 people last week and they told me that the chopping block is coming through my apartment. Am I going to be anchored in the promises of God that tells me that he's my provider? Am I going to be am I going to be anchored when people look at me and I find out that they don't, that they're, that they're laying off people left and right? Do I still have that same level of peace? Am I still going to sleep the same way as before I heard the news? That's what it means to have an anchor for your soul. Your anchor for your soul is wrapped up in the promises of God that God made to you, by the way, unconditionally. Oh, I, I know that's going to mess. Sometimes people think certain things. The promises from Abraham did not have laws attached to them. Going to get further into that in, 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 in a moment. Which hope, verse 19 again, we have as an anchor of the soul. You know what? Having an anchor for the soul, it lowers your blood pressure. There's a lot of people leaving here early. You know, we think that you think that the salt on the on the dinner table and the salt in the food is what raises people's blood pressure and causes heart attacks and strokes. Yeah, that does. We need to watch out for our health. We need to eat right and exercise. But there's this thing called stress that takes people out of here. Guess who wants you dead more than anybody? The devil. Yes, if you're not putting salt on your food, if you're trying to eat healthy and do all it, but you let stress come into your life. You're not anchored by the promises of God. You don't have an anchor for your soul. That's what it says. Anchor for the soul. What is the soul? The mind, the will, and the emotions. My emotions should not be going topsy-turvy every time somebody tell me something crazy. Every time I get some news, I shouldn't be flipping out on everything. I shouldn't be all over the place because my emotions are anchored. My soul is anchored in the Lord. My mind is anchored. I'm going to say the same thing all the time. Even if I look like a crazy person, it's going to be all right. God got me. He go take care of it. I don't care what they're doing. I know they said that they're doing this and they're doing that down the street. I know that they said they're doing this on the job. Yeah, I heard what the doctor said, but my soul is anchored in the Lord because I'm, my, I'm, pro I'm trusting in the promises of God. God wouldn't lie to me. Which hope we have as an anchor for the soul of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which entereth in, into that within the veil. There's intimacy. In the veil, there's intimacy. Whether the forerunner is for us entered even Jesus he made the high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek it's a promise God swore by himself and you know I used to have people you know you know you got people in their life and you used to really trust somebody when they, you know, I swear on my mama grave and I swear. And you like, man, okay. He's swearing his mama grave. And I, you know, I believe I swear on my daddy grave that I, and we like, okay, well, we got to take them seriously. You know, I had partners like that in the world, BC before Christ. And they were, okay. When they put it up, when they put the stakes up that high, when you swear by something, that's honorable to you, or you swear you make a decree, it becomes more believable. How much more God, who's never lied, who's holy, and says, I'm not just going to swear by somebody else, a person, place, or thing. I'm going to swear by myself. I'm anchored. We need to be anchored. In the name of Jesus. And any time that you feel like you're getting a little... A, a little antsy or whatnot, just say it out loud. I'm anchored in the Lord. My, I'm, I'm, my soul is anchored. I'm resting in the, I'm resting in the promises of God. Devil, not today in the name of Jesus. I'm not going to allow this to worry me. I'm not going to allow this to rob me of my peace. I'm not going to allow this storm to blow me to and fro. My soul is anchored and resting in the promises of God. Look at what it says. We're going back to the text. Romans four, going back to verse 14. We started at 13, Romans 4, going to 14 and 15, King James, Romans 4, 14 and 15. For they which are 
of the law be heirs. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void. And the promise is none effect. Because the law worketh wrath. For where no law is, there is transgression. So you have the Jews. And even today, this because this is a word for 2024. This is a word for today. You have people, you have the Jews who thought that because they were either born into the Jew, Jewish lineage and, and they were keeping the law, that that's why the promises of God applied to them. Not understanding that the Abrahamic covenant, the covenant to Abraham and his heirs preceded the law. And so it was by faith, faith in Christ. And even today, you think that God, there's, there's nothing that we, that we have right now. There's nothing that God has given us. There's nothing that we have uh, inherited that we earned. Nothing. And God did it that way so that nobody could stick their chests out and say that I deserve anything. No, what we deserve, what's fair is death, hell, and the grave. The only reason we obtain anything is because Jesus bled and died for us to receive the promises of God. So when we receive things, no matter how long we've been serving the Lord, no matter how many Bible scriptures we read, no matter how much church we got in us, no matter how many church services we went to, anything that we get, our attitude is thank you, Jesus, because you didn't have to do it. Not no, well, you know, I was I was waiting on my car because you know I, you know, Lord, I I got fifty five church attendances right in a row, and you know I I sing on the choir because you know I deserve this blessing. No, you don't. I'm deacon so and so. I've been in the church for thirty five years, and I deserve that Cadillac off the lot. No, you don't. If God desires to bless us, and He does because He's already promised us this. There's things that he's already promised us. We just thank God that he made the choice to be the one that makes the promise. He made the sovereign decision. Did you see the I wills? Did you see Abraham pray for any of that stuff? Not or his heirs. Abraham didn't say, I want to be a father of many nations and answer my prayer. God made the sovereign decision that I'm going to bless you. It even said it in the, in the scripture we read before in Hebrews. Surely blessing, I will bless thee. I'm doing this because I'm good, not because you are. I'm doing this because I'm love, not because you love me. Even the scripture says we love him because he first loved us. Now, all of a sudden, we want to, well, I love the Lord, and you know I love him. <laughs> yes, I do. And it's like, okay, well, we act like we want a, a, a banner and a sash for, for loving the Lord. And who loved the Lord the most contest? And I just love him so much, and I want to cry a pool of tears over here just to show you how much I love him. And just I, I just love him, love him, love him, love him, love him, love him, love him. That's great. That's awesome. We should love the Lord but let's not get it twisted. We only love him because he first loved us. So let's stop sticking our chests out and taking more credit for what it is that God already begun to do in us. It humbles us. It makes us say, Lord, I'm nothing without you. I, don't, I can't even love you without you giving me the capacity to love you. It's a humbleness of mindset, and then it's an understanding of the unconditionality, if there is such a word. Maybe I just made it up, did a Jesse Jackson. And the unconditional love that he has for us. Amen? Second question. What do you think it means to call things which are not as though they were? What do you think it means to call those things which are not as though they are? Oh, thank you.
Um, Holly? Yes, we can hear you. I can hear bottle water, baby. We can hear oh, you. Sorry. Oh, oh, I'm so sorry. Did I put my phone off of mute? I'm so sorry. No, no problem. I thought you had a. I thought you had a comment for the question. No, 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 okay. no. I'm listening. I'm listening. I'm okay. sorry. I'm putting myself back on mute. Okay. Anybody have a answer to that question or want to chime in? You can chime in via the chat or unmute yourself if you would like. What do you think it means to call things which are not as though they were? I think it means having faith. Um, okay. Some people think that you're lying if you say that, you know, though I I may be poor, but I'm rich, you know, but the, the word tells us that. Um, but basically, uh, basically, like if someone is, is has an ailment or something and it's telling them that they're healed in the name of Jesus. Something like Amen. that. Amen. Amen. Can What's you explain the question more for me? What do you think it means to call things which are not as though they were? So basically, someone has terminal cancer and they say that per you say, I'm healed. I'm completely cancer free. Or the person who has, you know, banks, bank accounts in the negative and they say, you know what? Uh, I see my bank account in the black in the name of Jesus. And a quick story, um, I know someone who actually was diagnosed with HIV and she never spoke it. She never, she kept saying, I'm healed, I'm healed. Um, and a couple years later, she went back and they couldn't find it. She never even spoke it when they were like, oh, well, what does the doctor say? She was like, I'm healed. She never said it, never came out of her mouth. And when Amen. she went back to the doctor, the doctor was like, they couldn't find it, so. Amen. Praise God. Let us go to the word of God so that it can break it down even further. Verse 16, Romans 4, verse 16. Therefore, so now it's saying therefore, and he's saying therefore, because he did like, it's almost like I did a, a preface to what I'm going to say now. He talked about the promises of, of God, that were given to Abraham. We went back in Genesis and we saw that the promises of Abraham, the I will make you a father of many nations. <coughs> Excuse me. I will bless you. I will bless your seed. We saw in Hebrews how it said he swore by himself. Wrapping, encompassing all of that is saying, therefore, it is a faith that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all seed. So how do I obtain this same promise through faith? We are the seed of Abraham by faith. By faith in Jesus Christ, we are the seed of Abraham. He was talking about us back then. And not only that which is of the law, but to, to that which is also of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So we get that by faith, by grace you are saved through faith. It's not of works, lest any man should vote by faith. By, so through faith, rather, by grace, through faith. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before whom he believed even God who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Well, what's an illustration of that? He called Abraham a father of many nations before he had a child. That's what it means to call something that be not as though they were. You look at that child, you look at that son, that daughter, whatever it is, you know, and, and some things, of course, are the calling of God. So we can't necessarily pronounce a calling on someone and say that person is going to be a pastor or that person is going to be an evangelist. But we most certainly can give the blanket blessing and say that boy is going to be serving the Lord in the name of Jesus. I had a grandmother who prayed over me when I was a little boy. And right before she passed away, I was in the county jail and I was born again. So she did not get to see me teach the word of God in her lifetime. But God 
honored her prayer. We'll have a conversation offline, sister, on those topics. Definitely. We that, matter of fact, after a uh, Bible study. Yes, ma'am. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before whom he believe, even God who quickeneth the dead, who calleth those things which be not as though they were. Called Abraham a father of many nations before he was a father of many nations. That's what it means. That's what it means. I called myself healed. I call myself with the word of God because I'm not just doing a, I'm not just sprinkling a wand. This is not magic. This is calling on the promises of God. This is standing on the promises of God. The promise that God made was to us all through faith before the law. Some people won't teach that because they would say, well, you know what? That gives people a notion to abuse it. Because they'll say, well, there's no conditions. I don't need to, to live a certain way. And that's not what God is proposing, that we just live any type of way. But my question is, as a true born again believer, I don't want to live any kind of way. As a true born again believer, I want to follow the purposes and the path of God. As a true born again believer, you don't have to tell me to love God. So if Christ is married to the church and the Bible talks about this, it talks about a, a Christ being married to the church and our relationship with Christ being mirrored as a husband and wife, do we really have to tell the husband or do we really have to tell the wife that loves, loves her husband to go home every night? Do we really have to tell or encourage the wife that is in love with and is serving and is submissive to her husband to do those things that a wife is called to do from the word of God? No, we do not. So there's never a fear then because she has freedom well, she's got the freedom to not go home. So let's not tell her she don't have the freedom to go home because she might not go home. She might go over to, 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 to Bobby house or to Michael house or to Richards. No, that's, that's not even, that's think about that. That's not even a, that's not even a notion because we understand that this person loves this person. So the love within their heart is going to govern the relationship. Look at what it says in Isaiah. We're going to go back. We're going to come back to that scripture. We're going to look at what it says in Isaiah. Isaiah 55, Isaiah 55, verse 10, Isaiah 55, verse 10. Still talking about calling those things which be not as though they were still talking about the promises of God for us. They're not just statements. For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth and make it bring forth a bud that it may give seed to the sower. Notice that that's another teaching for another day, but it talks about the seed being given to the sower. You want more seed? You want to be a funnel? So seed to the sower, bread to the eater. The eater eats one time. You give him bread, here you go. Here you go, loaf of bread. That's it. Give seed to the sower. Seed means multiply, multiplication. No, verse 11, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please and it shall prosper in the thing where to I send it. It's going to prosper where I send it. The same way you put a seed out there in the ground and you know that the seed is going to sprout up the same way when we speak and pronounce the word of God, when we speak the word of God, when we call those things which are not as though they were, that's what faith is. Abraham was 90 plus years old when he had Isaac. Most say after, you know, after 60 or 70, you know, most guys can go a little bit longer. Than, but Abraham, I mean, Sarah was up in age. Impossible. Why would God call Abraham a father of many nations and then wait 25 plus years in order to fulfill the promise? That's a part of the testing. 
We're going to look at that in the scripture. Calling those things with the, so shall the word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. But it shall accomplish that which I please to so prosper in the thing whereunto I send it. God's word can't return unto him void. <clears throat> Let's go back to the scripture. Romans 4, we were at verse 17. Now let's look at 18. Romans 4, 18. Who against hope? Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations? According to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. According to what? That which was spoken. Underline, highlight, according to that which was spoken. Why is it going to happen? Because God spoke it. So shall thy seed be. Notice this, watch this, verse 19. And not being weak in faith, he considered not his own body when he was about a hundred years old. Neither the deadness of Sarah's womb. Pause. If you don't hear anything else tonight, Rhema word from the Lord is for you to stop for you and I to stop considering. The Bible says, in being not weak in faith, he considered not. We consider things after God has already made a promise. We get into trouble when we consider after God has made his promise to us. We consider our age. We consider whether or not it's doable according to the situation of the circumstances. We consider our past failures and whether or not God is going to do it this time. We consider what we have in a bank account when God gives a, a vision of what he wants to do in our life. We consider whether or not what's going on today as it pertains to how we're going to make it. We consider the stock market. We consider this. We consider that. We consider our current health. We consider all of these things. We consider how our kids are behaving today. When God says, when I make a promise to you, you don't need to consider anything else. The enemy wants you. That's when the Bible says when the word was sown immediately, the enemy comes to snatch the word that was spoken into our hearts and into our minds. The Bible says the enemies, how does he snatch the word away? We're getting you to consider. God going to turn that child around, but yeah, but look how he acting right now. God going to use you, girl, but look at what, look at my past five years. It, what are you considering? That God is a liar? God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should, sh should repent. We need to stop considering. This is so, so very impactful. This is one of the most critical and crucial threats to our faith and the promises of God being, being made, for, uh, uh, come to fruition in our lives as we consider. We consider too much. We ponder too much. God going to do X, Y, Z. Well, I'm going to consider my situation and whether or not it's conducive to God being able to do what he, after all, although he's God, he still needs perfect circumstances and a situation to work with. Where does that, where, where, where is that written in the Bible? Well, you know, he said he going to give me this building and everything, but let me consider what I got in the bank. When did, when did he say that? He said that he going to use me, but man, I didn't messed up all these times and this time and that time. When did that come into consideration? When God says, I will, there's nothing that can stop. I will. He's not making a statement just to make a statement. He's making a promise. We have to understand this is a promise. This is God's vow. 
Do we understand the brevity of it, the girth, the, the depth of it, the fact that the very God of heaven and earth is made a promise, not making, he's already made a promise. And yet we allow ourselves, the flesh, we allow the enemy, and we start considering. Stop considering. Don't consider nothing but what God said. God said it, I believe it, that settles it. That's a t-shirt. God said it, I believe it, that settles it. We don't have to look at it in its entirety, but in Matthew 6, very familiar verse, I'll just read the very first one. Matthew 6, 25. Know what it means to consider? It says, therefore I say unto you, take no thought. Take a few thoughts. Take several thoughts. Take the thoughts that mean something to you. Really write them down. Put them on a sticky. No, my Bible tells me. I don't know what yours says, but my reads take no thought. Not one thought. Why are we not to take any one thought? Because the promises of God have already said, take no thought for your life. What you're going to eat? What you're going to drink? nor for the body, what you're going to put on is not life more than meat and the body more than raiment. Behold, the fowls of the air, they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather in the bond. Yet your heavenly father takes care of them. Your heavenly father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? In other words, God, the, Jesus is saying, listen, I take care of the birds. They don't go to work. They don't put your time clock. They don't have a 401k. They're not doing anything. And I take care of them. They're not wondering every night. You don't see no bird in the tree. I wonder if there's going to be some worms out there today. I wonder if there's going to be some crickets out there. A little blue jay. You know if there's going to be some crickets down there tomorrow? Because I don't know if I fly out this tree tomorrow, if it's going to be any crickets. I'm just going to sit up here and worry in this tree all night. Set not one bird. They wake up singing. They already know it's out there. I ain't got to go to the store and get it. I ain't got to go and, and, and beg nobody for it. It's already provided for me. Verse 27, which of you by taking thought can add one cubit to his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil, neither do, do they spin. Yet I say to you, not even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. I clothe the grass, I clothe the flowers of the field. Wherefore, if the if God so clothed the grass of the field, which is today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe ye, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought. He says it twice. Take no thought. What are we considering? Saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Where shall we be clothed? Notice what it says. You know who worries about these things? Where after all these things the Gentiles seek. They consider the economy. They consider what's going on over there in the Middle East. They consider what's going on in the stock market. They consider what's going on when they get news from the doctor. They consider all of these different things. He says, but you know. For your heavenly father, notice this, notice this possessive, it's talking to us. For your heavenly father, put your name in the blank. For Johnny's heavenly father, knoweth that Johnny have need of all things. Make it personal because the promise was personal. He just didn't give a generic, a generic promise. The promise was individual. It was personalized. But sometimes we got to spend time in the word of God. We got to spend time in prayer. We got to spend time in meditation on his promises. He already knows what you have need of, but you have already have need of all these things. Since seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. What does it mean to seek ye first the kingdom of, right, kingdom of God? That means I'm seeking God. I'm, I'm not in panic. I'm not pushing the panic button when I'm coming to my heavenly father. That's like coming to somebody that already knows what it is that you need and you ask them again. And they're already capable of giving you and getting to you what it is that you need. That sounds redundant. 
He does want us to ask, but we're not asking from a standpoint of panic. Therefore, take no thought. He says it a third time, y'all. Now, that's three times in the word. When Jesus says something multiple times, that's, that's, that's a note to pay attention that he's wanting us to get it. Three times in this scripture, he tells us, take no thought. Stop considering. Take no thought for tomorrow. For tomorrow will take, shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is evil thereof. In this sense, it's not that we don't plan, but we're not worried about things that are outside of our sphere of what we control. We don't control tomorrow. We don't control next week. God does. And if my heavenly father already knows tomorrow, next month, next week, next year, God has already been to 2025. He's the, he knows the end from the beginning, the beginning from the end. So we have a heavenly father a father, let's not, he's God, but he's our father, relationship, intimacy, loves you. He already knows what's coming next week. So now, us who have children, you know something that is going to happen six months from now that could affect your son, your daughter's life. You as a parent, are you not going to tell them? Are you not going to share? You're going to know, I'm just going to let it happen. I'm going to let it get them. I'm going to... And you got the you got the ability to make provision to protect them from it, are you not? So why do we hold ourselves in a higher esteem when God is perfect love than our heavenly Father, who is love personified? In fact, He is where we get our love from. We don't even have the love that we have for our own kids unless God give it to us. And we look at God like, oh God, you don't know what's going on. You know what's going to happen. I, don't, I know you promised me this, but I, you know, if you just look at what's going on and you just look at what happened, I just saw it. Stop considering. Break your considerer. Don't take anything into consideration when God has made you a promise. He has made you a promise. All of those promises that we were talking about in the beginning, and there are so many more. Stop considering. Romans. Let's go back to Romans 4, Romans 4, Romans 4, <clears throat> stopped at 19, we're going to go to 20. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. How do you display your strong faith? Give glory to God. That means that you're thanking him already before you see the thing come into being. I give him glory. I thank you, Lord, for answering the prayer. I thank you, Lord, for the breakthrough. I thank you, Lord, for my healing. I thank you, Lord, for turning them around. I thank you, Lord, for turning her around. I thank you, Lord, for ushering in this blessing. Stagger not of the God, stagger not of the promise of God through unbelief, but with strong in faith, giving glory to God. Verse 20, verse 21, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. Pause there for a second. Fully persuaded. And I'm going to read on to the end, and then we'll come back to that. And therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now, it was not written for this sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed, talking to us, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead, who has delivered, who was delivered for our offenses, and was raised again for our justification. Fully persuaded. Fully persuaded. That means that there's nothing that can change your mind. You walk around with an air of confidence. There's nothing that can change your mind about what God has promised you that he's doing or going to do. If we're fully persuaded, then it looks like something. We can't talk about faith in God and then 
have this wavering faith. Will you build a boat on dry land? That's what Noah did. That's what being fully persuaded looks like. I'm build I'm I'm doing something. I'm speaking something that looks absolutely crazy. I'm talking about this girl that's going to serve the Lord while she in the county jail with 19 charges for being in a gang. I'm talking about me being a millionaire and I got 15 zeros behind a negative balance. I'm talking about being healed when somebody just diagnosed me with stage four. I'm talking about the Lord doing it in my life in the craziest ridiculousness of circumstances. That's what it means to be fully persuaded. You don't consider anything when people don't, when you don't consider stuff, you look like a crazy person. You start, to, you, you, you do what Abraham and, 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 and Sarah did you in your nineties and you preparing a baby, you're preparing a nursery to have a child that, that looked crazy. You see that in somebody's house and they both in their nineties, you go, Oh, you got a great grandbaby or a grandbaby you got coming. And no, oh, we're going to have our own baby. Okay. Will you tell a widow with nothing to give you a portion of her last meal? That's what Elijah had to do. He didn't, he didn't consider what she had because God told him, I commanded a widow to provide for you. So now when I knock on the door, I can't consider the fact that she living in the projects. I can't consider the fact that she got on ragtag clothes and she got a candle because the lights just got cut out. I can't consider none of that. I got to go in here and say, God told me to do this. So whatever God told me to do, I got to do it in faith because he's promised me a blessing through this. Dipping in the nasty Jordan River, Naaman, I... I got to consider the filthiness of the river. I got to consider the method in which God is going to do it. No, you don't need to consider the method. Stop considering. God, you, you're going to do this this way? Stop considering. It's been 10 years. Stop considering how long it's been. And stand on the promises of God. You don't have to go to it, but for your study, James chapter 2, 17 through 23, faith without works is dead. And that works is not talking about you working for something. It's talking about faith without corresponding action. If I say I believe something, there's corresponding action that shows that I believe it was one thing for Noah to get the instruction that God said, build the boat on dry land. It was another thing for Noah to go into wood and chop down trees and make a boat and build it on dry land in the midst of persecution, in the midst of looking like a silly person because it had never rained before. It's one thing to say that I heard from God that he's going to promise me a baby at 90 plus years old. It's another thing to go in there and start going to Walmart and all of these other places and going online and putting out a, a putting out a registry at 90 years old, talking about some, send me some baby clothes, send me a rattle and all that. Y'all y'all getting ready for your grandkid? No, me and me and Charles, we going we going we going to have us our own child. <laughs> That's when you push past it just being a statement God made to some random person to it being a promise that God made to me. You got to make this thing personal. That is what God is telling me to share with you tonight. Make this thing personal because it is. There are some things that I've promised you. Can you imagine having a will? in your house of things that someone has promised you, someone has left you and you never look at it. You never call it out. You never call those things, which be not as though they were. You never speak those things. You never anticipate any of those things. You sitting over here crying in a corner and the Bible will say, uh, what well, the will said, well, the so-and-so left you this. Why you ain't, well, they left you that and they told you that they would give you this. And they, we look more ridiculous for sitting on a will that's already been 
executed. It's already active. It's already been executed by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what consummated the will. And now we're sitting on it and we're thinking that it's just a statement that God made. No, it's a promise to you. God's word to us never fails. His word to us never fails. Stand on his promises. Hello, family. This is Pastor Jay with Hope for Today Ministries, and I pray that today's message has been a blessing to you. For ways to give, uh, if you look on the screen, we have our cash app, which is dollar sign Hope for Today Ministries. Uh, we also have our website, Hope for Today Ministries. Also, uh, my website, johnnybrenham.org, where you can find all of our ministry uh, workings and ways to give. And finally, there's a unique way to give by simply joining our shopping club. Uh, you join the shopping club and it has over 400 products. Every time that you shop for uh, items that you would already buy at your local grocery store or uh, shopping center, uh, will go towards our ministries. We have over 400 products in this shopping club from everything from soap, uh, coffee, tea, vitamins, snacks for the home, all healthy, all things that are going to help improve your health and also be a blessing uh, to our ministry and the work that we're doing. I do pray that we see you on the next video. Uh, until then, may the Lord bless and keep you. God bless.